Hello, everyone. It's Christine. Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman podcast. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. And if you're a new listener, I'm so glad you found us. We're in the middle of a series on women artists, women visual artists in particular. It fits into the larger mission of the show, which is to deliver something through every listen that produces a little bit more love, liberation, an aha moment, some humor, some good mood uh, in the context of our conversations, where you walk away feeling a little bit like more open to things that might happen in your life. Maybe a little more happiness creeps in. And I'd like talking to artists, as I've said in the past, because they are the cultural canaries. They sort of very sensitive, receiving messages in imagery, receiving messages in sound, and often can speak to the underbelly of what's happening in culture, like what's at the fringes, what needs to be heard, what needs to be said, and doing it in a way that it hits us, the receiver, in the old part of our brain, the part that's pre-verbal sometimes that, that hits our image processing centers, and we grok something, we get something in a way that, that we feel it differently. So I love talking to artists. Today, I'm doing a twofer because the, the women who are in the show are so fantastic. You'll have a chance to hear from Alexandra Ruchbrock, who is best known for her tiny little vagina sculptures, well, vulva sculptures, actually, now that we're using anatomically correct terms, which are gold ceramic, gold enamel, tiny things that she sold for people to buy a whole bunch and then pop them up sort of graffiti or street art style all over, as you'll hear in the episode. She calls them her GGG, uh, which is gold girl gang but also a play on the urban slang GGG, which is good giving and game in bed, as you will also hear in the episode. And then we get a chance to talk with a very young, dynamic fiber artist out of New York who is pulling off her family's long tradition and the traditions in the South of working in textiles, but doing it in these fantastical, neon, vibrant arrays And you'll hear her process and what drives her and why she does what she does and and how she honors her lineage in the process of making what look like utterly modern creations. We'll begin with Alexandra, and you'll see how she is both inspired and outraged by things that happen in the body politic and how that shows up in her work, and how she's also really reflecting back a universal stage of life that is highly personal about midlife and empty nesting. And I hope that that creates some reflection in each person listening on how you are impacted by things that are happening in the collective and things that you're experiencing that are common to humanity. So here we go. Alexandra Ruch Brock. The first things I want to know is, how do you teach school and are such a prolific artist at the same time? A lot of coffee. (laughs) A lot of coffee. Mm. And I'm an insomniac, so it works in my favor. (laughs) I'm really glad you're in the show. Um, I thought we could start by just, uh, would would you be willing to just describe the piece that's in the show? So the piece is called Gold Girl Gang, and it's a series of, I think they're going to install about 25 of them, but they're porcelain, hand built vaginas that are then gold lustered um, with like a real liquid gold. And I know most people, the proper term these days is vulva for the external, but I've been creating these for a long, long time. And I had them in a show called Legitimate Vagina in 2012 um, that I co-curated with two friends of mine, Patricia Miranda and Mia Brownell. And that was completely named Legitimate Vagina because at that time um, in 2012, that was when Lisa Brown the Democratic rep from Michigan used the word vagina on the Senate floor and was banned by the Republicans. And then the same time in August, um, Todd Aiken had said that whole thing with, you know, if it's a legitimate rape, the woman's body has a way of shutting that down. So we were so outraged by that in August of 2012 that we put together a show called Legitimate Vagina to combine those two things. So I still like using the term vagina almost as a political act and in support of Lisa Brown. (laughs) I don't even remember that. What do you mean it was censored on the floor? In 2012, the House Committee was dealing again with women's health issues. And Lisa Brown was on the Senate floor that said, you know, um, no means no, you cannot legislate my vagina. And she was banned from the floor for using that term. 
which is a medical term. It's ridiculous. So we had this exhibition and so, you know, to politicize and, you know, validate the word. I mean, she wasn't using a slang term, but they couldn't handle that word in the conversation. Stunning. We are still dealing with that in the tech platforms now. Like it, the word vulva was banned by this creative platform called Mid Journey AI, you know, and we're getting it all the time on, on Meta's various properties. And so how are you supposed to educate people if you can't say the words? I don't know. I, exactly right. T- tell me about your journey into, you know, becoming sort of aware of feminism or um, in, in your life. Did, did you grow up that way? Like, when did you sort of awaken to this stuff? I think, I mean, I was raised by strong feminists. My maternal grandmother and my mother were both feminists. I was raised to be aware of my body and, you know, have ownership of my body. And we were in a household of sex wasn't some secret and the idea of getting an abortion would be... When my mom was in high school, a friend of hers died getting an abortion. So she always said, like, if you're ever in trouble, let me know. You know, she didn't want anything to be a secret. I think then when it came to creating my artwork, um, when I was 18, 19, and I was at SVA at School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, um, I was taking a ceramic class with Hannah Wilkie. And Hannah Wilkie's an extremely well-known strong feminist artist. And I was making, I would walk to school and back then they would have the, um, you know, the vegetables outside and they would have at the vegetable markets in Manhattan. And they had these red cabbages that were kind of under saran wrap and they were, you know, this beautiful kind of form. And I was copying them in ceramics and Hannah was like, came over and was like, Oh, you're making vaginas. And I was like, shocked. And I was like, no, I'm making this cabbage. It's, you know, this, this kind of repetitive kind of ovally form. And she's like, no, you're making vaginas. <laughs> she's, and so she, this is 1988. And she's like, during lunch, you need to go to the SVA library and pull out the slides. Cause this is back in the day and look me up and look up Louise Bourgeois and look up Frida Kahlo and look up Kiki Smith and come back and educate the class. So that was my lunch assignment. So I ran over, got the slides and my world was like, boom, exploded of all these artists in the seventies, you know, creating all this like vulva vaginal imagery and understanding that that's what I was making. You know, this is all before the internet. So it's not like we had all this stuff so readily available. And I've since collected as many art books as I could, because that wasn't even something that you could find, you know, there wasn't even these, these art, you know, all these things were like, you know, microfiche or Xeroxes. It wasn't even like, I mean, now there's like tons and tons of art historical books and monographs of feminist art. But back then there wasn't, it wasn't as readily available. So she was a huge educator for me. Uh, You would think with like Judy Chicago and all of those people that it wouldn't be so shocking to do that now. And here we're doing it 50 years later, because I still want you to look and say, this is a anatomical part and this is here. And this is the portal you all came through and like pay attention like, why do you think it still gets excluded? What's that about? Misogyny and patriarchy. I mean, the art world especially. I mean, the art, work, art world has traditionally been, you know, a white man patriarchy. It's only finally changing now for women and artists of color. Do you think that's changing in part because women are making money and they can buy art? I, I think that's a tremendous part of it. I think also through social media and just getting together that women or artists identifying as women or artists of color have finally supported each other, you know, and I think now maybe women and, and people of color that have money are supporting living artists. Now, I think that's, in a, I think a lot of current collectors are making a, a, a conscious decision to collect art made by women or art made by artists of color that are living, you know, and supporting them in the, to, to create more. You know, and I also think a lot of artists, so like Swiss Beats or Jay Z, you know, Swiss Beats and Alicia Keys are have this huge, you know, collection and are supporting artists. And uh, Kehinde Wiley is doing residencies and other, you know, all these artists I think are that are making it are supporting the ones that are coming back up because they know how hard it was for them. You know, so I think the living are supporting the young living coming up, which is really great. I think that's a great takeaway. Like if you're out there, please don't go buy a print of somebody from 1880. Please go buy something from a local artist. Mm -hmm. Support the living artists. Absolutely. I have a dream to go to Black Rock, Senegal and like just go visit, right? Uh, Mm, I know. It looks so incredible. So incredible. But I mean, the fact that he even opened that and started it and supported it is just so incredible. So what's lighting you up now in your work? What are you finding challenging themes in your in your upcoming pieces? 
My current pieces that I'm working on right now are, um, that I'll be showing in Bridgeport, Connecticut in November is I started a large series of ceramic eyes. So th about 10 of them, um, five are smaller porcelain pieces, maybe about maybe two feet across and another five are about two and a half, three feet across. I was just going, you know, the last few years has been, have been really sad, right? Like between COVID and just the change of the world and politics, of course. And my son, you know, is in college and I had that whole like empty nest syndrome and midlife crisis and all, there's just like a lot of sadness and nostalgia. And I've just been like looking back on things. So I have these big, large eyes that all have different glazes and different surfaces with tears coming out and each one's representative of a different thing. And they're put together with silk cords. The, the, the eyes and the tears themselves are ceramic, but the rest I have silk cords and um, jewelry from my grandmother and myself and my mother and beads. And, and just so everything's kind of, I don't want to even say like altars, but they're crying and they have like a lot of personal connections to them. It sounds like some themes of grieving, letting go, witnessing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What was it like for you when your son left? What was the empty nesting free period? It, you know, it's funny, I've been teaching high school for 32 years. And when I started teaching, and I'd see parents crying at their kids graduation, I was, I was like, why are they crying? They should be so proud. You know, this is such a great moment until it was my own kid. And I totally got it. Like, oh, my God, you know, you raise them. And then you're so proud of them. But at the same time, you're so nostalgic for to have these, you know, babies. So like, it's just it's, you know, you're proud, but you're nostalgic at the same time. And then it's all of a sudden like, what is your role? Like, what is your next role? You know, because you've been so responsible for somebody. I'm not saying you're never, you're responsible for your child forever, but you know, you're so responsible until they're 18 and they go to college. And then all of a sudden you have this like newfound freedom, which is great and fantastic. But at the same time, it's like this weird push pull, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I have a, a lot more time now to make my work and I'm really, really happy about that. But then, you know, you yearn for, you know, the grass is always greener. You always want this and you always want a little of this. You know, when they're young, you're like, oh, I wish I had more time in the studio. And then you have more time in the studio and you're like, oh, I wish they were young again. So, you know, you're always like, want a little more. Did you do anything differently? Was there anything sort of other than more of the art? Was there anything that you've been waiting to do until you had less responsibility? like risk taking? Yeah, well, I just came back, I went on a safari this in July with three girlfriends. And that was amazing. So to be like on the other side of the planet. Um, yeah, which I don't think I would have done when he was 10, you know, so that was incredible. That said, also, just going out during the week um, to openings pre COVID, you know, when he was in college, I, you know, would finish, I teach public high school, and I'd get on the train and go to openings. And that was such a nice networking thing because I would try to get in to see exhibitions and, you know, do it on a Saturday, but not be able to do the networking or see people at their spaces because I was parenting. So that was fantastic. So before COVID, I was doing that like three times a week, and that was really, really great. So I enjoyed that a lot. Sounds like you're embedded in the art scene a little bit. I'm not a working artist. Tell me how, like, I've always imagined it as more of a solo pursuit but it sounds like it's a really networked pursuit for you like that you're talking to other artists and you're how is that for you what's what's the the soup that you're swimming in as an artist I mean as an artist for me you know I started teaching right away right out of undergrad and we didn't have social media so I felt for a really long time and especially in the 90s that I was just by myself you know and I think my network was my friends that I went to school with but once social media came out um, and, and to be able to peruse a gallery website at night, I felt like I was not missing as much as, you know, I mean, I'm very lucky. I live right outside Manhattan. I would go in, but to be able to peruse these galleries and look at work online, that was really helpful. Joining Facebook back when Facebook was the first thing, that was really helpful, especially back then. Facebook was a big conversation space for artists, especially the artists in New York. There, I found a really nice community of people to do that and connect with. And then when my son went to college and I started going out, you know, I got to meet, it was like that first year was so much like, oh, I finally get to meet you in real life, you know, that I've been chatting with you or talking to you online forever, or, or you know, through Facebook. And that was a really big time to connect. And that said, also, I, I curate and I do a lot of curation with large groups. My friend Patricia Fabricant and my friend Beth Derry, we've been doing this exhibition called Among Friends and we've done it three times. We just finished it. It was up this past May at the Equity Gallery. We had 300 artists in it. Um, and when we, the first time we did it, it was a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. And so just, 
you know, I love putting together exhibitions that get people together as a fundraiser, but it's also just such a nice community to have. I'm doing another one in October in White Plains through the Westchester Arts Council called Spectrum. That's going to be a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. That's got 130 artists in it. So I like putting together large exhibitions with people that are purposely also like small scale work. That's not ex- like the, all the work at Spectrum will be $300 for every piece. And 50% will go to the artist and 50% will go to Planned Parenthood. So, you know, affordable, good work and to support a good cause. And for people to learn, like, you know, a lot of people don't collect art because they think it's out of their pocket, you know, but for something like $300, you could have a beautiful nine by 12 artwork done by 130 different people, you know, and it's not a huge, you know, break in the bank, you know, so, and it's supporting a great cause. So I think that's really important to form community. The idea of putting together a 300 artist show while working and making my own work sounds like, again, I'm going to go back to the question in the beginning. You must have life hacks that you can share. How do you do this? (laughs) Well, the 300 person show I did with two other friends, like I said, Patricia and Beth, and the three of us, it was the third time we did it. The first time was 130 artists. The second time was about 200 something. 300, I think, was the max. We were joking around saying, oh, for the fourth year, we would do 400, but I don't think so. I think we'd go back to 250 because it gets a little hard to wrangle that many people and that much work. But the three of us, you know, we split up the the responsibilities. We worked together really beautifully. And uh, we had a lot of volunteers, like just hanging the show since it was the third time. We had a lot of people that were in the show come and help us install, help us de-install. Um, you know, it just the whole thing was run like a community, which was really, really great. I mean, we all work really hard. We plan it months ahead of time. So, but yeah, planning and, you know, a lot of time. Do you like the word sisterhood? Does it work for you? I think so. I think I like friends because it doesn't, I'm not just friends. I think it's not always just women. You know, I have uh, many male friends, but I, I do like the idea of sisterhood. Yeah, I think there's a there's a kind of a question that's been up around women being allies for one another that feels like over our lifetime, we're about the same age, that it's changed, you know, that there's there's more sense of reaching out and supporting each other. Do you have that sense? Oh, I absolutely feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, I've now in my 50s felt that I've never had such strong female relationships or that I have right now. Before that, it was harder. I think a lot of women had to fight so hard to get up in whatever career they were doing that I think people had to be selfish. And I think now that women are in points of power, they were more apt to like help support each other it's not I think it just maybe in the 80s seemed like such a competition um I feel yes I think women are much more supportive of each other now I think in my experience for sure and I think also with my students I see you know my high school students they all work together like so well you know and they're so supportive of each other yeah I feel that with the younger people I'm so proud of my high school students I I wish I was as ballsy and as smart and as just you know, angry and political. They're just, you know, they are just phenomenal. I have such faith in the future because of the young. <laughs> yeah, tell tell us more about that. What, what we're, you know, a lot of people aren't around people 14 to 18 on the regular. Uh, you know, we got some exposure when they politically activated for Parkland, for example. Like, the wow, God. Tell us what, what you're seeing and what you like and what the flavor is. I think... Like Park, like the Par- Parkland is the perfect example. I mean, this horrible thing happened. I actually had a personal friend had a loss through Parkland, and so at our school, because we had a connection to Parkland through a, a friend at work, um, my students did a huge walkout. It, you know, we they we have a large campus. They had like a drone, and they we they went out and spelled the word enough on the field with like drone photography, and they all circled around it, and they did a voter registration that day, and I think. Practically every kid in school that was old enough to register to vote, registered to vote. This is New Rochelle High School in Westchester County, so it's like 25 miles outside of Manhattan. Um, really multicultural school. Really happy to be part of that community. Yeah, they're just great. I think they know how to use social media in like a really positive way. I think they're great social activists, these students. Um, yeah, I'm just so proud of them that they're so brave and outraged. And I think, you know... It's so palpable. They're they're coming into a world between the politics and climate change, and you know it, they're, they really have to come in and just sweep up this tremendous mess that has happened over the last four decades. You know, it was really great teaching during the Obama era era because it was so positive, 
and forward moving. And I was just so proud to be raising my son during that time. And I was so happy for my students to have, you know, gay marriage be legalized. And for my Hispanic students with the DACA, they, you know, thinking they could finally, you know, go to, I had so many students that couldn't go to college because they weren't legal, legal. I mean, that's such a ridiculous word for a human being, like that they couldn't go to college because, you know, they weren't a legal immigrant. Um, so we thought all these things were changing. And, and then just with Trump, it just became so horrible and disgusting. And the kids are so pissed off and I don't blame them. And yeah, so we're trying, you know, I, I think it's great that they're as motivated and so forward motion, you know, that they are. You talk, I mean, you're talking about them using social media in a really positive and constructive way. Do you think the body issues and the image stuff uh, is different for girls than it was, you know, how's that, how's that changed? And has that changed in a positive way and a negative way? Like, what's your take on that with them? You know, I think before social media, it was magazines, right? So like magazines, you had all these like skinny models, and they all felt this and this. I think for for sure, social media is different is difficult, especially in like the bullying situation. I'm not I don't want to like minimize it. But I feel like the the bullying and the social is and the social media is really bad in the middle school age. But I think like that by the time they come to ninth or 10th, or I'm gonna say 10th grade, by the time these these girls are 16, they're just they've just become much stronger badasses. Do you know what I mean? And they just don't put up with it. And I'm, there's, I'm sure there's some that are, but I think they grow up a lot, you know, and they're definitely more streetwise and sure of themselves than, you know, we were at that age. So maybe because I'm teaching art, but I have like these amazing, strong, brave kids that are really open to everybody, are always in engaging everybody, supporting each other. I think in just in by the time they reach high school, they realize that all that stuff is bullshit. But definitely, I think it's it's a it's a big issue in the, the middle school age. I mean, that's just such a hard age, for sure. Maybe we can all take a little badass lesson from a 16 year old. For sure. Are there things you want to like get across to people about your work or about the sh- about the show or like why you're doing the show? Well, Christina invited me to be in this show because she knew of these, you know, golden girls that the, that I was making. I've been I've been um, part of the Nasty Women exhibit here in Connecticut. I live up in Stanford, and they've had a, that started uh, in 2019. And I was showing these pieces I was making just in stoneware. Right now, the ones that are in the show are porcelain, which is just a much more beautiful, delicate, smooth clay. Um, when I started this project, I was just making them in stoneware. So they were like a little rougher and grittier. And I was just spray painting them gold. And I had them up in the nasty women's show. And um, they were just all over the gallery, like on the pipes, on the walls, on the ceiling, just like, you know, taped up. And I was selling them for like $5. You know, I just wanted everybody to just be able to have them. Then two years later, which was the fourth nasty women's show, the theme of it was called rituals of resistance. And that's when I came up with the idea of like the GGG, the goal girl gang. Cause in slang, uh, GGG is like a good giving and game in bed. So it's just kind of being like strong and owning yourself sexually. So I also had them, you know, for $5 and the money was going to Planned Parenthood and for people to take them almost like a three dimensional graffiti piece or like a sticker bomb and to take the piece and stick it up somewhere and then hashtag it, you know, just so that they were like gold vaginas, like all around Connecticut, you know, and just so you're like walking around and there's just some gold three dimensional vagina there. And I just thought it would be like a funny way of, I think it's also good for like, I think the best way to educate people is through both intelligence and humor right so if it's like funny you know and then it just like people laugh and they get a little more relaxed and then you have like a better time educating um through the nasty women we also had another exhibition at the ely center where i brought in all the vaginas but they weren't painted or glazed and they had a whole day where anybody could come in and paint them or decorate them and then we were installing them and at the same time we had representatives from Planned Parenthood coming in and like educating people with pamphlets and leaflets and it was great because we had all walks of life you know like teenagers to older men women trans walking in everybody's like painting these vaginas and sticking beads to them and stuff and laughing and joking in it at the same time getting all this really good information so I think all sex education is always like a little bit like embarrassing or maybe not with somebody's religion. But when you're laughing about something and you're painting it and you're handling it and touching it and holding it, there's something um, very freeing with that. 
So I think the best education is always with a little bit of humor. You know, I think that's why we use slang all the time. It, it, it's because we're always trying to make it easier. So I think if you could do this, it helps, you know, at the same time you're discussing personal experiences or political experiences. And it just gets the, once the dialogue happens, it just rolls, I think. And then it just snowballs into like a wonderful positive experience. I love the little sparkle of delight you got when you were talking about this, <laughs> them being magnetized all over Westport or whatever. Yeah, yeah it was kind of great. Wow, now I'm thinking we should have a like vagina puppets and some kind of crafts at C24 Gallery. Although I'm pretty sure they don't want sparkles all over their floor. No, no, no. So when I wanted to do them for this show, I started making them, well, I started making them in porcelain because it's just a finer, like almost more elegant part of clay. And then I started gold lustering them because it, they're, they're real gold. I mean, they're painted with 22 karat gold. Um, it's a big process. You have to, you know, I, I make the pieces and I fire them and then I have to glaze them because luster ha um, kind of relates to the surface it's on. So I have to high fire the pieces with like a shine, a shiny gloss white glaze and they have a second firing and then put the gold luster and then fire it a third time. So they're very like labor intensive to get that beautiful, but they're gorgeous, right? They're gold, they're shiny, they're like so gilded and they're like the best, like they're perfect. They're like the most expensive ceramic vagina you're gonna find. So <laughs> I wanted to make them fabulous, you know. I think we've so. sold five of them already. Yes, we have, yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing that story. All right, if you could have one wish for the women of the world, what would you wish? Like I said, I just came back from Africa this summer and it's a, I think women in the world, we take it for granted um, as much as we're fighting for our rights here in America, we take it for granted how much we have over half the world. I, I would just love if women could just have equal rights to men. I just want to be, I just am waiting for the day where we could all just be human beings on this planet and not categorized as male or female or just it's it's also polarizing so i just you know after being in africa i would love for women in the world to have access to health care access to education access to just jobs and 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 just clean water i mean just like, like add the list make it bigger and bigger um i just would would be wonderful i think if women could be equal to men and may it be so We're on a twofer today, and we're going to hear now from artist Tracy Johnson. Tracy lives in Brooklyn. She's a young artist, right out of school, but her work has already been in the windows at Bergdorf Goodman. It's an explosion of color uh, mixed with color blocking and just so alive and so vibrant. You'll hear her inspiration next. So I actually grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, I went to public school, you know, for most of my life. I went to fashion industries for high school. It's in the city. Um, there I majored in art. Um, and it's like so funny because it's literally around the corner from FIT. Um, and I went to FIT for college and I majored in, in fine arts. Um, so it's like sculpture, painting, um, drawing, printmaking there. During a the pandemic, I was still in school and it was kind of crazy being in school at that time. And I hadn't gotten any materials from school like while I was home because it, it kind of didn't feel like we would be gone for this long. It, would, it just felt like we were gonna, gonna be gone for a week. And so I started kind of like making art at home for school and I kind of saw people making like rugs on Instagram and it kind of became like really new trendy type thing and I just kind of picked it up from there and I was always interested in like soft um, sculptures and just like texture and fiber art and just the rug making seemed like a really cool way to like put together painting and textiles and so it kind of just grew from there my love of like fibers. What's the process I was looking at those rugs on your site and for people who are uh, who haven't uh, seen them they're not like a rug that you would think of they're very unique shapes very abstract forms outlines of figures and incredibly colorful uh, can you tell us about the process of making one of those honestly i 
am a very colorful person myself. Um, whenever I paint, it's just very vibrant and very poppy. And so when I started to make the rugs, it was actually really exciting because, uh, well, you can dye your own yarn, but I haven't dyed my yarn yet. But the colors of the yarn are just so vibrant. Um, and with the rugs, it's not really like painting. After you put like a color down, you know, that's it. There's like no going back. And um, for me with painting, I would always be someone who would like overdo it and I would just keep going and going. Rugs just became like a way for me to slow down and be patient and to really think about the kind of colors that I was putting together on my like abstract pieces. So I do a lot of like landscape work that I'm like inspired by and a lot of like figurative work as well. And I've just always been kind of like drawn to like abstract like you know my favorite art period is like um fauvism like a lot of lot of different textures and a lot of like colors you normally wouldn't see in a painting that people don't love is i'm just like really attracted to that's kind of how it goes and i use like a tufting machine to make the rugs what's it what is that what's a tufting machine the best way I can describe it as it is it's like a sewing machine, like a portable sewing machine, but it's for yarn. And what it does is it cuts the yarn. Like I have a frame and then I have a cloth on the frame and the cloth is stretched, you know, kind of like how you would stretch a canvas. And then you use a tufting gun and it kind of just cuts the yarn in and out of the cloth. Yeah, then you, you kind of have your rug. <laughs> like, like a staple gun kind of? Except that it's pulling yarn? Yeah. Do you do sketches beforehand? Um, so, like, when I started, I actually just, like, kind of, like, freehanded it. Now I do, like, plan out what I am going to draw. And, like, I've, I've even seen people, like, project and things like that. And it, it's so funny to me because in school, it's, like, everything is, like, freehand and by observation. And so that's actually, like, how I, like, plan things out. I use myself like as the model for like all my figures because I don't have <laughs> I don't have anyone to draw <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna look at those with new eyes now knowing that they're all you oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're all like variations on your form and then what what do you do to seal the edges so you have this big frame but these shapes are abstract so do you cut them then around the edges and seal them and how are they backed and preserved so um, I'll cut out the, um, the cloth. Um, I use glue, my bad, to actually stick down the edges. Um, and then after that, I put like, it's like rug glue to kind of like seal the yarn so that it doesn't peel or anything like that. And then I use, it's so much glue. I use more adhesive, like spray adhesive. And I usually glue it down to like faux fur. That's kind of like becoming like one of my favorite um, materials to use too, because it's just like so fluffy. You can, you know, you don't have to lay your rug on the floor on the wall. You could actually lay, like put it in a 3D space, you can hang it so that it turns and so you see the faux fur. Um, and then I also use like a rubber pad backing that you would normally use for rugs. Um, so it kind of it kind of depends, but I usually do like using like the faux fur. Yeah, I saw you were doing journals with the faux fur and yeah. you know, installation spaces. This relationship to cuddle, it, it's like you have a thing where you're like living inside of a stuffed animal uh, collection in a way. I don't know. It just felt to me like very sweet and comfortable and, and tactile in that way. Just what's the feeling tone that you have when you're in working with all this uh, fluff and fur and, tech and, and warmth and wool and all of that? What's the feeling in it? It's a very like nurtured um, feeling, like very comforted feeling. For me, like, I'm that kind of person. I, I love to, you know, be hugged, to be, like, held. And when I thought about uh, using soft materials, that's kind of what I thought about. How does it feel to be cuddled, like, or kind of just be, like, surrounded by softness? And, like, I'm not someone who grew up with, like, pets. But I know, like, whenever I see people with pets and things like that, they're always, like, stroking them or petting them. And it feels really good for the pet, but it also feels really good for the person as well. It's kind of like a release. And so that's what I kind of think about when I'm making like these soft sculptures um, and these rugs for people to kind of be surrounded by them. 
And so they can have that kind of sort of release. You know that that's a, that's a scientific fact that petting animals produces oxytocin. It releases a flood of your happy chemical. Yeah. So you're on it. You're on it for sure. I mean, what I like about what you're saying is that, you know, a lot of times art is separate from the body. It becomes all visual and it's kind of prohibited to engage with it in a tactile way because, oh, you might have greasy fingers or something like that. So this is a sweet invitation. Yeah, like I always say like, you know, art that reaches like, you know, the five senses is very successful art. I kind of hate that art has become so elitist, you know, and the fact that even when you go to a gallery or museum, you can only, you know, see something. And a lot of people, you know, maybe may not be able to see, maybe they kind of learn just by touching or just by hearing, you know, so I kind of want like my art to be able to touch different senses because people learn in all different kinds of ways. You know, you you mentioned that you're heavily influenced by being in nature also. And can you talk about how that's woven into your pieces? Literally woven? Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> so honestly, like I uh, grew up a city girl, but, um, you know, I had a chance to visit this farm for like a whole week when I was like 10 or 12 when I was in school. And I just really loved being outdoors. And then from there, I always like go upstate and kind of just love going hiking and being in the woods and kind of just being serene. And so I think a lot of like the way nature is very organic and kind of like how water flows and the trees are just the way that they are kind of like informs, I would say kind of informs my forms, like the shapes and how fluid and how free I want the shapes to be and how I even want to be as a person and kind of just like that serene and that peace. I want, I always try to put that energy into the pieces and I kind of want that energy just when people look at, I want that energy to flow through them. Now we're getting into energetics and the transfer of your energy into the work and how that is then read by people in the space. Like it's the difference between buying a copy that's made by a machine and make and getting something that's made by hand. Uh, by particularly if it's someone you know or you know their process and the amount of work that went into it. So you haven't gotten to the point yet where you're doing replicas of your work. You have some magnets, I think. Yeah, I have magnets. You know, I did like graphic prints during the pandemic, like, you know, with Photoshop and with Illustrator, but I haven't really done any prints yet. I think I I just really have magnets. For me, I kind of want to, well, I started making, you know, my work off commission. So everything was very unique to the specific person. They would let me know what colors they wanted, reference photos they would send, and I would just kind of work my magic. So everybody really does have a one of one piece. And for me, that's just like so much more special than doing, you know, replicas of something and it's really curated to the kind of person. So I I actually haven't started making similar pieces yet. So everyone right now does have a one of one piece. (laughs) <laughs> you hear that? If you're out there, Tracy's got this piece in the Sensing Woman show. If you're out there, this is the time. Go grab that because she is going to be collectible for the rest of her life. I mean, the girl's bursting. <laughs> is that how the Bergdorf project came about? I saw that you did the windows at Bergdorf's this summer. Yeah, so I actually made um, these soft sculptures for my thesis last year. And uh, the director, the visual director of Bergdorf's, he saw um, my pieces at FIT. And he, like, my mentor, she's also the exhibition manager there. She just, like, put us in connection. And he really loved um, my work. And they they have a fiber show up right now, which, I, which I'm in. And he was just like, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And I kind of just got everything from my studio and I was like, let's just make it work. Let's put it up there. And for me, I, I wanted to do windows actually in college. I was going to like transfer my major to um, exhibition presentation design. But then I also realized that it's a lot of computer work and it's, <laughs> it's much different than what I thought. Like I, as an artist, you know, you think that, you know, 
whatever you give me, I can just do it. It's all like very visual. Um, and so when I mentioned this to her, it kind of just came full circle. And so when I when I did the window, I just put everything in it and I'm like, I didn't have a plan or a sketch or anything. And I'm just like, let's just see what the flow is, what works and what doesn't work. And I just made a whole environment out of the space. And that's also like what I am working toward to create like installation um, spaces. But it just, it worked out so great. Like, I love it. If you get a chance to go to Tracy's website, which is Rugs by Kilauea. Yes. <laughs> and check it out because it gives you a sense of particularly how vibrant her backgrounds are against the color blocked mannequins that are sitting in there. They're like, you know, very, very brightly primary color kind of color blocking. Uh, yeah. So what, who is Kilauea? Yeah. So Kailua is actually like. Kailua. Kailua. Hawaii. <laughs> and I always like wanted to go visit Hawaii and that's definitely like on my bucket list and I just really love the name when I you know when I was in high school I was trying to figure out kind of like my Instagram name and it kind of just like stuck with it and it, it it's kind of funny because for like younger you know people my age in, Instagram and social media is like very very uh prevalent it's very like important and so you know Sometimes you might name, you know, you might use your own name, but I didn't use my own name because it's already like millions of Tracy's, whatever. But and I didn't want to use any underscores. So I just came up with that name and it kind of kind of stuck. And I don't know, people call me Tracy, people call me Kailua. And it's like it's a little alter ego. I'm very fluid. You haven't been to Hawaii yet. I haven't. I, I actually am planning to go for my 25th birthday. So I just turned 24. But yeah, I'm going to go soon now. <laughs> okay, you do know that I live on a farm and garden in Hawaii. Do you really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's my home. I have a 40-bed yoga and retreat center on the big island. Oh, my goodness. And it's a, it is, I mean... If, if you're doing this kind of vibrant work without having been extensively in the tropics, yeah. everything is like this. Yeah. We have a, th a thousand different kinds of anthurium, yeah. like this little penis flowers that are just like incredible, like the, just every shape you can imagine, like double sided and pinks and magentas. And I would love to have you come. Yeah, no, I, I definitely need to come to Hawaii. Like, you know, I've been to like Bermuda and I've been to Mexico and I'm just like, I love being like overseas and just like on the island. It's so different than like being in the concrete jungle. My nature, girl. <laughs> your mind, it takes your mind elsewhere. So you grew up in Brooklyn. You're a nature girl with a, a, a clearly some kind of lineage from the tropics uh, in your veins, running in your veins. What were your, did you have artists in your family? Were you in your mother, your grandmother, I mean. Yeah, so my, my, my mom actually like really loved uh, basketball. Um, and I, you know, I could say she was like an artist at basketball. I, I think so many people tell me she was so great. And the reason why she never like pursued it professionally, because they're like at the time when she was younger, there wasn't a women's basketball league. Like the WNBA is like very like new league. So, she, you know, they always say all the time, you know, if they, they would have made it, she would have like, you know, been playing in the WNBA. And my uncle, like he was like an artist, he was like a chef, like, and so I, I think just like creatively, like there's like little sprinkles like in my family, but even there, they're just like, oh my goodness, like, where is this coming from? And I, you know, I have them help me like make my like crochet blankets. I have them help me make my fur letters. And it's so funny because they're like, we don't know how to do this. And I'm like, you just do it. <laughs> you just figure it out. That's perfect. You just do it. You just, no fear. <laughs> Pretty badass. You talk a little bit in your artist statement about bringing your family along, like, like, you, you know, sort of speaking opportunity to lineage, I guess. Like there's a concept in time science called retro causality that you could do something today that would change the past. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy idea. But in some way, when you bring your ancestors along to your current work, you're kind of doing that. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Like how does your work rest in, in lineage and how do you see it fitting in with your embodied experience and your, and your maternal line? 
Honestly, that's a really heavy, deep question. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we could go back to fake fur, but I'm really, you know, really interested. Like, so honestly, I think it, it's probably very subconscious. I think, but when I picked up, you know, fiber work and crocheting and everything, it kind of led me to think about. Um, you see, my my family is from Virginia, um, the South, and in the South, you know, quilting and designing, you know, your own dresses or making your own clothes, that was something that, you know, my ancestors just, like, did, like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm gonna make the shop and sell these clothes, it was like, you know, I have these five kids and I'm going, I have to make, you know, what they're gonna wear to church, what they're gonna wear to school. I think, I don't know, just subconsciously, that kind of creative, like, lineage just kind of like followed me and whenever I do go back to Virginia I go to like my cousin's houses and you know they're they're older and I will see like just paintings and like creative like blankets and quilts made out of all these different textiles and you just see like little things that they've carried with them from like hundreds and hundreds of years ago to them even now so it's kind of crazy how that translates and with my family, like, I often, like, try to always include them because I want them to see, like, you know, this is possible to live like this. It's possible to think like this and to kind of break down barriers that, you know, they were taught and they think that they have to live by. And when they see me, you know, making work from scratch or they see me talking about, like, you know, safe spaces and, like, you know, breaking down trauma, they're like, their mind is blown. They're like, oh my goodness, I had n- no idea you could even do this. And I'm like, you don't you don't have to abide by what society has given to you. You have the opportunity to break that. So I try my best to always include them and to always like let them know what I'm doing. Maybe it's like an inspiration thing because they inspire me and I hope I can inspire them. Are you always this calm? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, honestly, I take CBD like, well, you know, every couple of days, things like that. But I, I try to be a very chill person. <laughs> I feel it, like chill and trusting of the process and trusting of the work, and what's going to manifest and when you just put your heart into it and you open up. Do you have a, a spiritual relationship? Do you have like a, a sense of being channeled in any way? I grew up like going to church like every Sunday. I would say my creativity too was just in that nurtured in that as well because you know I would sing, I would dance, I would present, we would do like public speaking, you know, it would do all, all fours of talents that I didn't even know I had that sometimes I wasn't really good at, but um <laughs> I am a very like spiritual person, I would say. I don't go to church every Sunday now. I still do try to be a good person. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like that's religion. That's got nothing to do with being a good person, but it's nice to have community. Well, I'm excited to see you live at the show in a a month. I guess it's in a month. I think the show is going to be insane. Did you get a chance to look at the program? I did. I got a chance to look at the program and I got a chance to look at all of the artists and their work. I actually want to show you, show you this. All of the artists, I actually made like this vagina sculpture in class, like probably like when I was a sophomore. And it's actually out of like I hand crocheted it. And so when I saw all of the artists in the show and they were making all of these vagina sculptures I was just I felt so like good because I've never seen that before and I think when I you know I was like probably like 19 making this and I just you know I it's just good to see that you're on a right track and that people are thinking like you are thinking you know and so it just gave me like more confidence like in myself and I'm just like this I'm good. I'm like I'm on the right path. Yes. You know what? Uh, I have this feeling like we're still getting censored for saying the word vulva. Like that women can't talk about their intimate anatomy. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We're going to talk about it on the panel, but that the algorithmic censors on social media can't tell the difference between women's health and porn. 
and also that women themselves don't want to look at their organs and their bodies and understand their cycles and understand what orgasmic birth could be or um, how to speak to their physician about having good sex or how to speak to their daughter coming of age about her period or anything like consent culture. None of that stuff is really um, able to be spoken of because the genitalia themselves are denied. And in this way, by like putting up, like, what do you look at this thing, this portal, which gave every single human on earth life? It's amazing. And if you look at it, then we have an opportunity to have a real conversation. If you keep turning away, then there's no conversation. You have to look to heal. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited about it. I want a giant, I want a giant vagina rug. Oh my gosh, I actually should make that. Because people really like gravitate toward the femme rugs. And I, and I really do think it's because it's like full anatomy and it's like, I don't really know why people are so scared and so afraid of something, to see something that they have. But uh, w- when you're an artist, it's like you are drawing and painting nude bodies, you know, for six hours plus a day. And so it's not really taboo to, you know, see figures or see the human body in that way. You know, it's we see it in very more beautiful light because we're looking at it as, as shapes and as forms. You know, rather than be like, oh my gosh, you know, so. You know what, you just hit it. You you spoke exactly to the issue is through exposure, it gets decharged. Yeah. We, you know, the on the Hawaii land, it's very nativist, like, like nudist. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I can remember when I first was there, it was difficult for me to be naked. I would get nervous about like people, you know, I had all kinds of shame about that. And then over the years, it became normalized. Mm-hmm. And I had a a guest from Los Angeles, and he uh, wasn't that used to that. And and I saw it, like he walked up into the spa area, and he was a little high on mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And everybody was naked in the hot tub, and he's like, tits! (laughs) tits <laughs> he like said it out loud and he said i haven't seen live breasts since the beginning of the pandemic it's kind of shocking i don't know what to do with myself but like he he like had to literally walk away to handle it but it just reminded me of how without exposure it retains that charge and that's why seeing a naked breast breastfeeding or a woman who is like just topless enjoying the sunshine can still be sexually charged because they're not spending six hours a day in the studio like you are looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and then being like, oh, it's just a beautiful form, you know? So I think um, exposure therapy, that's what we're going for. <laughs> even if, even with the art, like, please look. Okay, I have this magic wand question and you can make a wish for the women of the world or the women, female identifying people of the world. You can make a wish, you can grant a wish. What would your wish be? I think my wish would be like for, you know, female identifying women to not carry such a large weight on their shoulders of who they ought to be and just be who they want to be without any pressure from society or from men or from people. Authenticity to all beings. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy Johnson. Alexandra Ruchbrock. If you love talking to these women, know that every day at Sensing Woman, four artists will be presenting, two in the morning and two in the afternoon, talking about their work and their themes and, and how and, and what they're seeing emergent in the culture. In addition, we have dozens of panelists and speakers uh, on everything from women's health, sexuality, sensuality, politics, law, media, spirituality, uh, also speaking during the day. And Tuesday nights are VIP opening night with Eve Ensler. Wednesday night is a program of storytelling with Generation Women. They have a really wonderful collision style thing they do where they have a woman from her 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s all come up and tell a story. So you really see the threads across the generations. And that's on Wednesday night. And on Friday night, we have Sexy Vixen, Silk and Lace event by Rap Priestess and the singer of Goddess Codes, Lizzie Jeff. So all of this programming is to benefit reproductive rights. If you come to the site, sensingwoman.org, 
You'll also be given the chance to purchase a work of art for your home and 50% of the proceeds of that go to reproductive rights and intimacy justice also. I hope that you are feeling the creative vibe and totally inspired by these artists as I am and that you love and adore and cherish and revere the opportunity to be alive in your body, that there's only joy and no shame, and that we are standing tall and acting the body politic from this centered experience of self-love and self-respect. So wishing you all of that, to self-love, to self-respect, to reverence. See you next time.